Coming up, I'm going to reveal two big pitfalls of the modern CEO. And then, what are organizational ghosts? Do we need to call the Ghostbusters? No, we don't. But we'll explain and how it applies to all of us. Let's go. Welcome to the Ken Coleman Show, where we help you grow personally so you can advance professionally and lead effectively. So what are these two pitfalls? Well, we'll get to those in a second. Everybody wants the power and uh, the prestige that comes with being the CEO. I, I should say not everyone, but if you want to lead and you want to move up the ladder, then then ultimately you want to see, do I have the chops? You know, it's like, it's like playing a sport. You know, if you want to play the sport professionally, you want to see, can I be the best? And it's a very natural uh, desire goal for someone who is leading, who wants to lead well, desires to lead well, desires to lead with influence, to move up to the CEO. But the actual work of being a CEO, well, this is a little bit different story. So it's not just as simple as wanting it and, and, and trying to learn it. We're going to break this down. So if you're going to stand out and be great at any job, whether it's leadership or not, you need to make sure that the work that you are attempting to be excellent at, to be great at, actually is congruent with you. In other words, it lines up with, with the fact that you love this work. And here's why this is important. If you aren't willing to suffer in order to do this work, then you won't stick with it. Because in order to be great, you've got to be willing to suffer. That's why I call the different types of work that you love to do passions. The, the root word of passion means to suffer. And you, uh, you will know when you really have a passion for something if you're willing to suffer. Let me give you some of the examples. You know, I was just watching uh, the uh, NFL Combine this weekend. And all these young uh, Division One football players are trying to make it into the NFL and be drafted, and and so they have put in time and time and time and time and time and time, just for years and years and years. Starting maybe even the middle school level gets very serious at the high school level, and and it is a full time job to be a Division One football player. It just is. And I was watching them compete. They're competing to make it to the highest level. They want to be great. They want to win. They want to get paid. They want to be great, and they want everything that comes with being great. And so you got to love the game of football, or else you just won't do it. Or maybe if I interviewed some of those young men, they'd say, I don't love football, but I love my family, and this is a way for me to change my family's life. And so I'm willing to suffer injury. I'm willing to suffer the intense workouts. I'm willing to suffer rejection suffer disappointment. I mean, I could go on and on and on. And so you will know if it is a passion, if you're willing to suffer for it, and if you lose track of time when you're in it. So I'm willing to suffer to get the opportunity, right? And then when I'm in the middle of it, I love it. So these guys that really love the game of football, they're willing to suffer for the opportunity. And then when they get the opportunity, well, it's everything to them. They lose track of time. It's it is it consumes. That's why you see a lot of these athletes weep at the retirement ceremonies. So things that lift your soul, things that energize you, and I could tell you over decades of coaching men and women, I've identified uh, fifteen types of work that we uh, that we love. So if you look at talent, we've talked about that before. But if we look at the type of work that we love, you go. This is this is a type of work. And do we love it or not? So we don't love all 15, uh, and, 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 but it's important to understand that if we just look at the world of work, we kind of said, all right, these are the 15 types of work, and we call these passions because I got to find something that I'm passionate about when it comes to work. So if you want to see the full list or you're not sure what your passions are, I highly recommend you take our Get Clear Career Assessment. You can get it at RamseySolutions.com slash Get Clear. RamseySolutions.com slash get clear. And you can get a full report, not just on your top three, but where do you rank on the other 12? But today, I, I want to do something different. And we're going to speak to leaders. Those of you who want to lead, you don't have to be a CEO. I don't want that to, to throw anybody out. But the idea of leading, but I, I think there are CEOs who, who needed to walk through today's teaching before they decided, do I want to ascend to the level of CEO? 
So I'm going to talk about five specifically from the list of 15 that are in the Get Clear assessment. And, and we're going to walk through those as a way for you to say, you know what, I should, I should love all five of these things or else I'm not cut out to leave. That's what I'm going to posit today. I'm, I'm saying that is something I'm willing to put a stake in the ground. But first, two pitfalls that I see a lot of modern leaders, CEOs, fall into. Number one, they sign up for the job and they haven't done the work. They haven't done the inventory on their heart to say, do I love what is encompassing being a leader? Now, every leadership position is different, but by and large, there's a lot of similarities and commonalities, not to the specific day-to-day task, but the role of a leader. And and I think they signed up and, and then they never said, do I love this role and this role and this role and this role? Or do I just like the idea of the status of the power of the money. That's the first pitfall. It just becomes a place to go and it's, and it's, it's admired and boy, it has lots of good things attached to it. Make no mistake, but it's not something they deeply want. They're not willing to suffer for it. And so watch in this first pitfall, when they actually get to the point where they've got to suffer and they go, something's off and, and they, it's not for them. And then they go from a suffering that is voluntary. So if I go work out today and I go really hard and I'm tired, I'm sweating and it hurts and I'm exhausted and the next day I'm sore, I've chosen that suffering. But these CEOs will get into tough leadership positions. They haven't chosen the suffering. So guess what happens? They begin to suffer and it's not voluntary. It's involuntary and they suffer burnout and they suffer maybe marital strife and all kinds of substance abuse, whatever it is. So that's the first pitfall. The second pitfall, they love some of it, but they're unaware of the other roles and so that, that they don't love. And so they just go, oh, okay, I got to take that on. And they don't think about, wait a second, this is an awareness issue. I should delegate this type of work that I don't love. I love some of it and I will be completely on fire and I will be an amazing leader if I step into just the work that I love and I delegate, I remove, I hire for the other work. So those are the pitfalls. So I want to go now into what I believe, uh, and this is from the 15 passions. In other words, this is a type of work and you got to figure out in the assessment, does it for you? Do I love this kind of work or does it drain me or is it just eh? All right. So here's five essential passions of a CEO. And I'm not saying that there's not more. I'm saying I don't think that you can be an effective CEO if you don't love these five passions. The first is leading. You come alive. If you love leading, if you have a passion for leading, you come alive when you get the opportunity to communicate to influence. You just do. I get a chance to influence people, to move them from A to Z. You get excited about it. Second is advising. Uh, You just love offering guidance and advice, suggestions. Hey, the more people ask that of you, you don't get drained. You get energized. You love it. Three, solving. Oh, listen, you get energy when some people cower in the face of problems. Problems come your way. You go, let me at it. Let me take my suit coat off, roll my sleeves up. Let's go. I'll get dirty. I want to get involved. And you look back at those first two, the idea of leading. You love to influence people and communicate and influence a vision and a, and a process. And, and then we look at advising, stepping in and go, hey, I think we need to do this. Well, see, this is all part of solving. You're fixing something. Could be people issues. Could be process issues. Next is creating. You love creating new things. Uh, ideas, they come to you and you love it. You love diving into it. We got to find a new way. We got to find a new path. And finally, planning. Boy, you get wrapped up in a good strategy session. A plan for a project or an endeavor for a group of people. You love planning. So, quick review leading, advising, solving, creating, planning. These are five that I believe you have got to have some passion for for those 
types of roles if you are going to be a CEO because that's what comes with the territory. So why does all this matter? We don't want you to fall into the pitfall of getting stuck in a title but not thriving in a job. Hey, I want you to stop and imagine your life four months from now. You got a new skill and a starting salary of more than $75,000. Now in 15 weeks, and for only $5,000, you can get the skills to land a job in front-end web development through a Bethel Tech micro-credential. And that's way less money and time that you'd spend on a traditional degree to make more dough. Listen, folks, coding skills are in high demand. So with Bethel Tech's front-end web development micro-credential or their data science micro-credential, you can move up. The next class starts April 29th, and the Bethel Tech folks offer you 10% off because you're a Ken Coleman Show listener. Go to betheltech.net slash Ken Coleman for details. Terms and conditions do apply. Hey, are you trying to figure out next steps professionally you want to advance or maybe you're wanting to pivot? Uh, If that's you, I've got some really great news. This is a free invitation. The whole thing is free. I just want to encourage your head and your heart as I've been there before, this idea of I know there's a next, but I'm not sure where it is or how I get there. You're just trying to think through next steps, whatever your situation is. I want to invite you to join me for a free webinar. We're going to dig into a very clear process to allow you to get the clarity you need so that you can confidently step forward. The uh, webinar is Tuesday, March the 19th at noon Eastern, 11 Central. That's Tuesday, March 19th, noon Eastern, 11 Central. And uh, you can sign up at kencoleman.com slash webinars. All the details are there, kencoleman.com slash webinars. Love to see you there on March the 19th. Okay, a fascinating article here uh, that the uh, the team brought me. Uh, the title is Organizational Ghost. This particular article I'm going to pull some stuff from. It's called Organi- Organizational Ghosts continue to haunt businesses long after they're gone. Um, now, this is not paranormal activity. So some of you got really excited. You're like, wow, Ken has finally joined the conspiracy nuts. We're going to talk about ghosts. I was watching a movie recently, and I guess there's another installment of Ghostbusters. And just for the record, I have no interest in watching it. It looks dreadful. There's only one Ghostbusters. And I think there's been a lot of successful sequels I don't think that Ghostbusters ever needed a sequel. I think one and done was probably great. That's my opinion. I digress. What we're talking about is, and this is an idea from Brigham Young University researchers, um, the phrase, the term organizational ghost refers to a very influential leader of the past. Okay? So think Walt Disney like his name is still on the building. Okay, if you look at Disney stock price, you look at Disney CEOs and how that's changed over time. Walt Disney and his values, his vision has very much come into question. Do are we maintaining those values? I'm not getting in the middle of that argument. What I'm saying is the spirit, the ghost, if you will, according to BYU researchers, of Walt Disney looms large. Here's another one. How about Steve Jobs? You can't think about Apple and and Tim Cook is I mean, by all accounts, I think he's done a very good job uh, in in replacing Steve Jobs. But you just think about somebody who's that big of a deal. And, uh, you know, I I can think of Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A. You know, I'm just telling you, this is what they're talking about. A very influential, legendary, let's call it iconic leader in the organization. And the idea is, is that their persona of their impact was so large that even after they're long gone, whether they're dead or not, that ghost, if you will, is in the hallway. Fascinating idea. Now, hang on with me because this has got a really personal turn to this. And and I'm going to share it with you. This is not just a leadership uh, application. So hang out for a couple minutes. For those of you that aren't in leadership, you're going to go, oh, Where are the ghosts in my personal life? We'll get to that in a second. So the guy leading the research is a guy named Jeff Bedner. 
He's associate professor at the BYU uh, Marriott School of Business. And he goes on to explain in detail, this is um, a ghost it comes to us in the form of someone asking themselves if a former leader would be proud of what they're doing, or they might imagine how a former leader would approach a certain task before attempting it themselves. So I think we all get that. Uh, research revealed that organizational ghosts play crucial roles in safeguarding organizations. That's fancy talk for protecting the values or the culture of an organization. Uh, helping them maybe from a risky decision. Hey, would Walt do that? Or how would Walt approach this? Okay. Um, it legitimizes current actions. Maybe a new leader will say, I'm doing this because so-and-so did it. Or it could diminish the influence of new leaders. In other words, that nice Casper the friendly ghost might turn into an evil ghost if it begins to haunt in a negative way a new leader in that the way Walt did it back then worked, but would Walt even understand the current environment? And you can see here how that could go negative pretty quickly. In in one way, it could protect the values and the and the culture of the organization and be a an inspiring memory, or it could be a haunting memory that keeps a person completely or keeps an organization completely bound by the past. It's pretty fascinating. Um, Bedner goes on to talk about his personal experience with this idea when he was an intern at Walmart in 2005. Now, for those of you who don't know about the legendary Sam Walton, but Sam Walton is the Walt Disney of Walmart. Okay, we're talking about one of the most successful companies in the world, certainly in the U.S., and Sam Walton is revered. I've met people that worked at Walmart. They talk about Sam Walton, you know, like I talk about Michael Jordan. All right, it's just Walton is great. He's a legend. And so this is his experience. He said, this is in 2005, folks. So it's not that long ago. And, and a long time since Sam Walton was involved. People in meetings were always talking about how they should try to do things the way Sam would have done it. It fascinated me, he said. The impact and influence a leader could have on an organization even after they're gone. And, and from a leadership point of view, if you are a leader and you come outside in, let's just describe this, you come outside in and you know a little bit, maybe you know a lot, but you're a new leader and there's this legendary leader could be still on the premises or gone, but has a absolute huge impact on the organization. And you come in, you need to be aware of this and sensitive to this so that you don't step on some landmines. Now, some of this could be very, very good, but some of it could be you could be seeing that they are literally stuck in, 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 the, in their ways, and it makes no sense because this is the way they've always done it. And here I am, a new leader, a new perspective. I've got to honor the past, but I've got to help navigate the future. And, and that means we got to make some different kind of decisions in the present. Here's the deal. Be aware of the ghosts. I think just aware that the ghosts are there gives you a lot of emotional intelligence to try to navigate that. Now, let's flip this. This phenomenon is, is, no, is not just confined to a big business or academics. Everyone should be aware of ghosts in their lives and the way they continue to shape their thoughts, emotion, and behaviors. So here's the question they pose in this article, and I'm going to just transfer it to the audience. And, and I'm going to do it through, I asked myself. Here's the question. Which ghosts are most influential in your life? Now, I want you to think about people in the past. Now, again, doesn't mean they have to be dead, but maybe a parent who had a huge influence on your life and now you're in your 30s and you're trying to navigate this. Wait a second. I'm now actually in my 30s. I'm married. I got my own home. I live life this way. We're raising our kids this way. And I feel like I got a ghost in the way that my parents raised me. Come on. That, that's real. Could be in a, in a, a dead grandparent, a dead parent, that maybe your relationship wasn't healthy. And maybe on earth, when, when they were here with you, you never quite felt like you got their approval. And now they're gone. Is there a ghost haunting you? Maybe it's a spouse. 
a loved one that you lost and you feel like they're looking down on you every day and you're constantly going, am I doing what they would want me to do? That That's an example of a ghost that is affecting the way you think and feel and act. That's real. Hey, listen, how about a ghost in the form of a kid right now? Maybe they just went off to college. You know, I mean, what does that ghost look like? What? Who is that person that is or was so influential in your life that they still, the memory or the values or the experiences that you shared with them continue to shape your actions? I'm telling you something. This is really powerful stuff. And many times it's negative. Sometimes it's positive, but I think more than not, it's negative. And I think we need to all do a little ghost busting in our own life. A little ghost busting to realize that it's our life, our decisions. Yes, there was positive. Yes, there was negative influence. But it's time to get out there and bust the ghosts and live the life that you're supposed to live to the best of your ability right now. Who's afraid of them ghosts? I know I can be. Ghostbusters. We could all improve our lives by being Ghostbusters. Welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show. Hey, if you ever want to get coached up on the show, let us know. You can email the show, ask at kencoleman.com, ask at kencoleman.com, and we will we will set up a time to coach with you. Joshua is is in the shoot, ready to go in the arena now, Joshua. What's going on? Oh, not much. How's it going, Ken? I'm living the dream. What are you doing? Oh, I'm 1% better than I was yesterday, so That's good. That. Listen, that's yeah. good. I like that. So how can I help today? I'd love to contribute to another couple percentage points here. Yeah, um, there's a lot going on, to be completely honest with you. Um, I'm in a job that I absolutely love. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been doing it now for six and a half years, Mm -hmm. um, and I currently make about $36,500. My wife and I are $184,000 in debt, and we want to become parents soon. And so one of my big questions is how can I increase my income effectively Mm -hmm. and still keep this job that I am over the moon passionate about? Now, I know that that culture is not currency, um, but I I really love where I am, the company I work for, the job that I get to do. Yeah. Tell me what you're doing and detail out maybe the top reasons you love this job. Yeah. Yeah. So I work for an elementary school fundraising and fitness company. Okay. So the very first thing we do when we get to campus, we have a big pep rally. We get everyone really excited. We interact with all the students, all the teachers. And then over the next few days, we're meeting with the students and we're teaching them character lessons, what it means to be trustworthy, respectful. We are looking for ways to serve around the school. So we can reshelf books in the library. We're making Sonic drink runs for Teachers, we're just looking for ways to go above and beyond, um, all while raising funds to make a difference at the school. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the program, we have a big fitness event. Uh, It's a big celebration, and the students have a lot of fun during that process. I love it. What do you love most about? Give me three things you love most. I I love being a positive influence um, to younger generations. Um, I, I love the people um, that I work with because of the amazing culture that we have created here. Are you talking uh, about people in your company or people that you're interacting with, you know, when you're going on these campuses? Both. Okay. Um, and I also like the change of environment because we're only on a campus uh, about a week and a half. Mm-hmm. So, that change in environment is is refreshing and also helps me from um, experiencing as much burnout as I would if I were just on one campus consistently. I get to meet a whole bunch of new people, get to impact new people, yeah. um, get to create awesome memories. Yeah. 
Interesting. And you make thirty six five. That is correct. And you've been there six and a half years. So my guess is you've topped out as as it relates to your growth in the organization. Is that true or is that false? That is false. Okay. Um, what does growth are, look like? So within this company, there are growth opportunities all the time. Um, there are shadow opportunities of upper leadership. There are actually two opportunities that opened up today. And one of them is an opportunity that I have been after for quite some time. How long? Um, I've been after this position now for probably two and a half years. Now, after it, does that mean it's open before you applied and didn't get it, or you've just been wishing, wanting, communicating about it? So, both. Um, at, it did open at one point, and I was not even considered at that time okay. for an interview because they already had interviewed a candidate okay. that even the people in the home office said it was the best interview they've ever heard for that position. Okay, good. So you seem to get a great attitude about it. You realize you weren't the right, it wasn't the right time. You weren't the right person. It wasn't a no, it was a not yet, not there. Great. Correct. Okay. How much would you make if you get this gig? Um, honestly, I, I'm not sure. Um, I know that people um, above me typically start at about 40000 but the job that I would be going for would be a sales in which I would earn commission on top of that. Which, give me a ballpark. Any idea what you could make in that role? Um, I do not. Well, this is part of the problem. Uh, part of the problem is you don't know enough in your current situation because I can't even give you advice as to you know whether staying is a good move or not. Now, I'll do my best. So you've right, got let's, let's let's ballpark and say it's about sixty thousand. Okay, so what I think that's realistic. Okay, great. And so that was that leads to my next question anyway, which is what's the number when you call me today? You're going, Ken. I need to make more money. I love my job, but we got one hundred eighty four thousand dollars in debt. I need to make more money, and you do. You absolutely need to make more money. Um, how much money are we talking about? Where you'd go? Okay, this is. I'm grateful for this, and I can make some real dent in my debt with this kind of money. What's that number? Um, so my, my wife and I would like to, to have a take-home pay of 80. Okay. And we, we are both getting our master's degrees. And what is she? Is she working right now? She is. She actually works for the same company. What does she make? Um, she is um, hourly, and I think over the last... No, just give me gross. What's your both? What's your take home, for both of you? If you're at 36.5... Uh, 50,000. Okay, so she's barely making 14. Yes. Good grief. The, the 50 is take home pay. The Yep. So we want to get to 80 gross. Is that what I heard? Yes. Okay. Well, if you can get to 60 with this job then that means she only has to bring home 20, and my guess is they really like her as much as they like you. Is this true? That is true. Um, and she's getting she her is, master. so when would she be eligible for, like, real money? Um, about a year. Okay. She's in her internship now. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, because you love this work, uh, and because you are you would feel very comfortable and your goal is 80000 together, and this, this new job that's open... Uh, you've got a sure crack at it, right? They're going to give you a shot? Yes. That didn't sound very confident to me. Um, it's only because I have interview anxiety, but I, I am confident that I will step in for an interview this time. Okay. My point is, is they're going to give you a shot at interviewing. Whether or not you do well or not is not what I'm asking. So you've got a shot at this, correct? Correct. Okay, good. So here's the You take your best shot. So here's what happens. If you get it, then you bust your butt and you try to max out that 60. And now she's got a year left, so you're going to be, at, uh, before she can, I guess, get more than 14000 And so if that's the case, then the moment you get to 60 and she's still pulling in fourteen, or if it's around the same time, then we're really close anyway. So we're going to be plus on the 80000 side. We're gonna Once she gets going, you guys are going to make more than 80000 The question is, can you... Can you keep your head above water with all this debt until that point? If you can't, then you bust it, you get the job, and you still are working a side hustle. You just are. 
you're going to get out there and try to make an additional 15 to 20 grand. She, I don't care if she's in her master's program or not. She need, we need to figure out, can she bring home an extra thousand to 2000 a month? Okay. And so we do what we have to do right now. So that later we can do what we want to do. Cause that $184,000 is a lot of debt and that's going to take you time to knock that out a lot of time if we don't increase your income. So whether you get this gig or not, you need uh, a second or a third job if you love this, and I know you love it, and I'm proud of you for loving it, and I admire you for loving it, but if you're not willing to leave this job making 36 5 or you don't get the one that bumps you up to 60 then you got to go work an extra maybe a third job, and she needs to get a better job too. We have got mm-hmm. to increase our income. The faster you increase your income, the faster you get out of debt. The faster you get out of debt, the more options you have, and you can continue to climb this ladder at the speed you want to. So there's there is there's two options here. One is you get the raise through this job. I say go for it. Give it your best shot. If you get it, you still may need to work an extra job while, while we're waiting for her income. I wouldn't wait a year. That's $184,000. We need to attack that in the next year. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, it, it does. Uh, I mean, I, and that's the, that's the thing too, is I know that my, my wife's really wanting a kid. I'm, I'm really wanting a kid and having this much debt and bringing the, a kid into the equation scares me. It should, it should. And so you also need to be tough enough to sit down with your wife and go, this is not a good time to bring a baby into this situation. Let's wait, let's pause. Mm-hmm. I want a Lamborghini. I, I really like a Lamborghini, but that's not realistic for me right now. So I'm going to have to wait. There's some things I'm going to have to do, right? Right. I'm being sensational with my example, but okay, babe, let's chill. We need to wait two years before we start trying. Here's why. Cast vision. Here's the other thing. You may love what you're doing right now, but you may need to go like something that pays you triple. And then we can come back to the thing we love. It'll still be there. So I know I'm not giving you a lot of rosy scenarios, but I'm giving you real scenarios because we have to increase our income dramatically. You two should be combined $100,000. With this kind of debt load, you guys should be doing what it takes to have a combined income of a hundred grand, and then attack this debt with absolutely everything you've got so that we can have the child and not be stressed out about money. Can I just tell you, there's enough to stress out about as a parent. Don't add money to it. Thanks for listening to The Ken Coleman Show. For more, you can find the show on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and watch the show on YouTube. You can also find Ken across all social media by following at Ken Coleman.